Uh, this is just the kind of general agenda of what we're going to be doing today. Um, an overview of Clean Energy Decatur, um, what this project is all about. Um, a community challenge listening session, um, hearing a little bit from um, some of our guests about potential policies that the city can consider during its clean energy plan. Um, an engagement activity is going to take up the bulk of our time. Um, and then just an overview of what we'll be doing moving forward. So why are uh, we here? Um, on October 28th, so just a, a few weeks ago, um, the city launched its effort called Clean Energy Decatur. Um, and this is going to be our plan to transition equitably and efficiently towards a clean energy um, system, uh, setting goals for our community and our path to get there. Uh, this effort has really originated um, uh, based on the community feedback that we got during the um, Destination 2030, our updated strategic plan that was just adopted last month by the City Commission. Um, that effort began way back in January of 2020 um, and through a kind of rigorous uh, series of roundtables, um, surveys, um, and other engagement efforts, uh, we've identified some uh, key community priorities two of which are um, climate action and equity. Um, so you can see here on, on the screen, kind of an overview of those, some of those climate action items. Number one is establishing clean energy targets. Um, and if you go to the plan, you'll see um, numerous other climate action targets and goals, but also ones that relate to equity. Um, our new strategic plan does really try to advance these uh, community priorities together. Um, and so that's, Kind of the basis of why we're here and i'm going to turn it over to megan i believe to kind of get us um, into the substance thank you david so my name is megan o'neill i'm with southeast institute and we along with our partner greenlink analytics who will also be presenting today are supporting david in developing this clean energy plan and we wanted to kick things off by hearing directly from you. So if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and drop a few comments in the chat, letting us know what clean energy means to you. We can lift the ask. Thanks, Cyrus. So first up from Cyrus, we see a healthy and safe future for your kids. From Mike, energy independence, not worrying about where my electricity is coming from. From David F, what it takes to protect the earth. Rob O, a livable future. Kevin, supporting the local economy. Diana, a more resilient community. From Preeti, health, energy generation from sources that are 100% free of greenhouse gas emissions during source and use. Well, thank you for all of this feedback. Please go ahead and keep adding things as we go on through and don't hesitate to ask any questions that you might have as we're going through here. Oh, I see two more. So from Blythe, an affordable energy future for those who have suffered from our duty energy economy. And from Hobie, clean energy for Decatur means lowering our carbon footprint to zero through initiatives for energy sourcing, energy efficiency, transportation policy so that our community is equitable, livable, and sustainable. And from Gary, to piggyback on Preeti's comment, those include nuclear and hydro, especially pumped hydro. Annie says new job opportunities. So 
what is clean energy? And thank you all for feeding into that because it's going to be so helpful as we talk through this moving forward. When we're talking about clean energy, we're talking about energy generated from sources of energy that don't emit a carbon emissions. So things like solar, as well as energy efficiency, weatherization, hydro, and otherwise. And we're not generally not talking about items that result in fossil fuel emissions being emitted into our air. With Decatur's clean energy planning process, it's important to note up front that unlike a lot of jurisdictions, Decatur hasn't yet set a formal clean energy goal. They want this planning exercise to inform what commitments they make. And that includes things like how are they defining clean energy and what timeline they want to accomplish this transition by. So we're really excited to be talking with you okay. and we absolutely want your feedback on that as we go through this process. Some of the benefits of clean energy that we see include improving public health by making our air cleaner, just as Preeti was indicating, creating local jobs through economic development, reducing energy burdens and making energy more affordable, which can improve housing affordability. And energy efficiency also has the potential to improve housing quality. In green, here's a landscape of the current greenhouse gas emissions indicator. The orange indicates commercial properties energy consumption and the blue indicates residential properties. So here you'll see that commercial buildings energy use does account for the majority of greenhouse gas emissions from buildings indicator. And you'll see that the majority of this is also coming from electricity with natural gas accounting for not an insignificant amount of emissions. And when I'm using natural gas in this context, I mean for things like use in your home or building, so heating, cooking, et cetera. Our current sources of energy are displayed here. And what these three charts indicate is the 2018 reflects what is our current energy supply. So where is our energy coming from right now? It's 30 something percent coal, 20-ish something percent nuclear, with the balancer being natural gas and a small sliver up top for PV in yellow and hydro in blue. And you'll see the middle bar represents 2025 and 2035. And you'll see changes there. And these are the changes that are currently planned through Georgia Power's last integrated resource plan. And you can see here that the share of solar does increase over time, but that the balance so the majority of energy consumed in 20 or produced in 2035 will be coming from a combination of coal, nuclear, and natural gas. So Decatur's clean energy planning process can be an effort to help alleviate this discrepancy right now, because currently if no further action is taken in 2035, the majority of Georgia's fuel sources in Decatur will still be coming from fossil fuels. So as we move forward to create a clean energy plan, there are a few steps we'll be looking towards. This is something many cities have undertaken and committed to. And the process we're going to follow here in Decatur is to initiate a stakeholder engagement process. And through that, host a series of community roundtables, webinars, one-on-one -on -one conversations with businesses, local leaders, the community-wide kickoff, a series of roundtables, youth engagement through high school workshops. And we're going to be reviewing the feedback that we're receiving from you and fellow educator rights, and using that to consider diverse energy system policy and program scenarios. And we'll be weighing that against the energy policy modeling impact analysis that GreenLink Analytics will be conducting to assess the different technical pathways available to us and the relative pros and cons of those. And when they're doing that, they'll be looking not just at technology, but also co-benefits like public health impacts, job creation, and otherwise. So we'll review these feasible scenarios and, and use them combined with the stakeholder feedback we received to draft and refine a clean energy plan, publishing three rounds of and drafts, and then finalizing and delivering that plan to the commission and then move forward with implementation. So with that, I'm going to hand things over to Aton Guberman from GreenLink Analytics, who's going to speak to the energy burden analysis they've performed so far. Aton, just guide me through the slides. 
Great. Thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. Nice to see a lot of familiar faces and also some some new folks. Um, I have about um, five minutes, so I'm not going to introduce myself beyond that. Um, and I'll uh, I'll let Megan decide if we're taking any questions. Uh, I'll try and be crystal clear. Um, so energy burden is defined as the, the fraction of uh, household income spent on energy costs. Usually this is um, direct consumption of natural gas and electricity. Um, so this is, we're, we're not talking about uh, transportated related, you know, um, fuels, usually um, gasoline or diesel here. Um, and for some context, so the national um, median energy burden in 2019 was around 3.6%. Uh, Georgia's was uh, noticeably higher than that at 5.4%. Uh, in the county, um, I have a slightly different year, long story, but uh, shouldn't be a big deal. It was just over 4%. Uh, and in Decatur, there's, um, Four census tracts, which is which is the unit of measurement here. Uh, you can see in these two pictures, um, Decatur's right in the middle there. The four somewhat purple and you know right in the middle and two below those. Um, the the energy burden median ranges from just over one and a half percent to over three percent. So that's context setting. Now um, by definition. People who are living in high energy burden have an energy burden of over 6%, and uh, over 10% would be considered a uh, rather severe burden. So just to give you a sense of equivalence, so a 6% energy burden would be spending $125 a month for a household making $25,000 a year. 10% would be $500 a month for a household making $60,000 a year, in other words, $6,000 a year total. Um, so two of the census tracts that I numbered 226 and 227 there, um, we, we calculate about how many um, households are expected to be in that severe category uh, based, on the, um, based on the range of incomes and the, um, the range of uh, energy bills. Uh, so you can see it's it's a little over 370 for each case, which is over 10 and 20 percent in each. So even though those are, um, you know, the median incomes are, you know, healthy there, you, there's obviously there's a range of, uh, you know, incomes and energy bills. So uh, next slide, please. So this is, uh, this is a view of uh, Greenlink's equity map where I grabbed the, uh, the previous slide. Um, that is something that um, we're gonna be working during this um, project to, uh, to, bring, uh, to bring into the uh, city's um, website. But for now, um, anyone who's interested in having access to this, um, you can go to uh, greenlinkequitymap.org. I'll, I'll drop a link in um, when I'm done speaking into the chat um, and you can request a login. Um, and I think in less than 24 hours, you should be approved to be able to fool around and take a look at this. Um, it, it has over 20 indicators um, beyond, uh, many beyond energy burden. Uh, next slide. Thank you. So um, in Georgia, um, there are there are not uh, payday loans, but the number one reason nationally that um, that uh, people take out payday loans is to pay for utility bills, and there are other you know vehicles. So this is um you know this is a big deal. Right, how much you're paying for energy can really uh, it can be burdensome, and you can see the statistic of uh, you know over 30% of Americans have have had to make tough decisions about whether to pay utility bills or or 
pay for food or for um, medicines. Next slide, please. So um, there's there's a number of you know interrelated uh, things that that are worth paying attention to that I'll talk about. Uh, next slide. So health and economic and environmental issues that are associated with uh, energy burden. This is a long slide. I'm not going to read through the whole thing, but um, you can sort of glance at, um, you know, energy burden is correlated with a lot of these things, right? People who are, who are living uh, with higher energy burden are experiencing more of these other, um, these other um, challenges as well. So reducing energy burden can also uh, correlate to reduce stress in these other areas. Next slide. Um, so one example, uh, we, we just wanted to, uh, to share a sort of a, a numerical example. So for that um, hypothetical family that I mentioned earlier with uh, making $60,000, um, a high energy burden, which is defined as 6%, so that would be about 300, that would be over $300 a month. Um, what it takes to reduce that to the national average of around three and a half percent is reducing their bill, their bills annually by $1,500. So through energy efficiency, through subsidies, through, you know, whatever, reducing rates and fixed costs, however you get there. But that's sort of the, the level of the, um, you know, the hill to climb. And you could say, oh, you know, the target should be to reduce it to the Georgia average, whatever, but just as an example. So um, this slide illustrates, you know, where to the right, you know, where in a house you can tighten up for energy efficiency measures, right? Energy efficient measures are often the cheapest way to reduce uh, electricity bills. So, um, you know, weatherization, retrofits, um, codes, et cetera. Um, I think people can go back to this slide since I appear to be over time. So I'll just, I'll go on to the next slide. I think you spoke for too long, Megan. Pressure's on here. So um, one of the last things Sorry. I wanted to <laughs> just giving you a hard time. Uh, one of the one of the last subtle points I wanted to make, and um, you know, th this is probably not um, th this is not like news to anybody, but I just want to emphasize that. Um, when we talk about the, you know, electricity rates or energy rates going up or down or staying flat, that is not at all the same thing as what's happening to um, an individual's bill, right? So, um, you know, your bill is essentially your consumption times your rate. So if one's going up and the other's going down, you know, your bill may be flat or it might go in either direction, right? So we don't want to get distracted alone as to what's happening with the rates or if utilities are talking about, oh, if we have too much clean energy or distributed generation or solar, that's going to put push pressure on rates, right? I mean, because ultimately the metric that I think people are more interested in is what's happening to bills when we're talking about the economic component of this. Um, so energy efficiency is going to be one of the best things you know you can do to um, to reduce um, bills regardless of their impact on rates. Um, and just to be um, you know crystal clear, you know what's happening with Plant Vogel is certainly the kind of um, investment in our uh, power sector that is putting upward pressure both on rates and on bills. Um, I may have one more slide. I can't remember, Mega. Nope. Okay. Um, thank you all. And I'll, you know, if there's questions, whenever they're appropriate, I'm happy to answer. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Lacey Davis. Hi, everyone. I'm with South Face Institute as well. And I'm going to lead you through a community challenges listening session. <clears throat> so I just put a link 
in the group chat. And so if you click on that link, it should take you to a Miro board. And Megan, if you'll click on the link in the slide, then we will do this first Miro board all together as a group. And then we'll do another engagement activity um, later. We'll, we'll, we'll break out into two different groups. So the first thing you want to do when you pull up your mirror board is zoom out so you can see the whole board. And we're gonna just take about 10 minutes here and we're gonna go slide by slide. But first I'll introduce you to how to use a mirror board. So if you look on the left column there, you'll see an arrow. And if you click on that, then you can go to any of the uh, sticky notes that are on the slides and you can double click on them and you can directly put a comment in those sticky notes. Um, you can also, what Megan's doing is go down to a sticky note and create your own. And so you pick a sticky note and then you can just place it anywhere on the board you'd like. And then you can type directly in it. So we'll all be working on the same board together. And if this is um, complicated or not working for you, you are also welcome to just go ahead and put your comments directly in the chat. And someone from our team will populate um, the mirror board for you. Does anyone else have a German mirror board? <laughs> Everyone else is English, okay. Well, um, okay, so we'll go ahead um, if everyone is ready and we'll move to the first section. So this one's about community impact and I'm just gonna give everyone about two minutes to populate this board. Um, really just asking you to take a moment and describe any potential community impacts um, of a clean energy transition. So we're gonna just work on this first board for about two minutes and then we'll discuss it. It looks like many people are on the community challenges board, but I'd encourage you to use your cursor to drag over to the board that reads community impacts here. So what we're looking for here, um, this is Robert Reed with South Face as well. Um, what we're looking for here is really the, 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 the thoughts you have about the positive impacts um, and potentially the negative impacts as well. So uh, feel free to just grab a post-it. Um, you can change the size of it and, and chime in around uh, the, the, the potential community impacts of a clean energy transition. And to sort of set it up a little bit, um, we're going to be talking about, uh, well, this is the impacts that's sort of more generally positive. Uh, challenges will be the next topic, uh, and then some personal challenges um, and impacts will be uh, a third topic that we'll be talking about. So sort of focus on what are the impacts here um, moving forward. Uh, so great, great first one that I see popped in there was increased disposable income and household savings. And that's a great uh, observation to, you know, as as we use spend less money um, on because we have uh, and more energy efficient homes, you've got the potential for building some wealth and um, increasing your disposable income, uh, which generally stays in the community as opposed to being shipped out of the community uh, with an energy um, uh, or an energy bill where most of that goes leaves the community uh, for fuel. See one here, nice enlarged one. If solar storage is used, resilience in the community in the case of extreme weather events and grid, grid interruptions. Um, one of the things that uh, the project uh, uh, 
some neighboring communities have done in projects is to uh, create some resilience hubs, some cities that uh, or some locations that have solar, uh, in which case that might, might still be have uh, power in a, in a power in a major power outage. <clears throat> I see one down here as well. The uh, healthier buildings with greater comfort. Uh, in, in, in energy efficient buildings, generally speaking, are um, uh, have better air quality and have homes uh, or homes in particular as well. Uh, if we can, one of the research topics we've seen is that if a, a home is has better air quality, uh, the number of asthma days that a, a potential asthma um, sufferer may have is are reduced if we can have a uh, good eight hours of, of air, good air quality. It's great fun to watch seeing you all move around and, and click and grab. Hopefully it's, um, uh, we are um, getting everyone sort of linked in. So we're gonna give a few minutes here because of the number of people that had a, an initial trouble linking in, but it seems as though I don't see anything in the chat that says we're holding anybody up. If you are having trouble populating any posts, you can drop items in the chat and we can do that for you. I see one here, pride in my city for being a leader that uh, we were discussing that today and, and or yesterday and in, in, um, in some of our uh, stakeholder interviews and the importance of what might happen uh, among the, the leading cities in Georgia who are um, contemplating these um, and uh, contemplating clean energy transitions and what sort of power that creates uh, for making change at the at the state level. So um, we're, we're pretty excited about that one too. This is awesome. I want to make sure we have time to get to each slide too. I see a little bit of, Sorry. I was going to make a note about our um, uh, the the first one we sort of noted the increased disposable income and the um, reduced um, energy burns in our community. Sort of that economic um, benefit uh, is seems to be a recurring theme. Uh, there's also some health benefits here as well. So sorry to jump in there and, and uh, um, feel free to, you know, Lacey, if you maybe want to move some of those sort of together, they're talking about income and reduced burdens. We can sort of see the sort of that power of how big that gets and make some room. Yeah, absolutely. I like the one that was stated here, a place young people want to come back to and move to and stay in. It uh, is, um, you know, the um, generation, uh, gener younger generations are very keen on um, places that are making moves in this, uh, in this realm. And so Decatur being a leader is, is a, is a, a def definite um, benefit to uh, keeping uh, the population coming in and keeping the economic development going. Clean air, some notes there. <clears throat> All right, so it looks like we're uh, still a lot of still a good number here. Um, if you're still have some more ideas, um, 
if you're continuing your ideas and you feel like you've just got several more, please let us know in the chat that uh, you're still sort of doing it, but it looks like it's tapering off a little bit. And so we are, do want to get to the next board as well. So yes, yeah, so let's let's go ahead and move to the next board and uh, start that one. I think you'll have a little bit of opportunity to continue with some of those as well. <clears throat> so this is uh, community challenges with energy costs. Um, taking a moment to describe any community challenges you're aware of regarding uh, energy costs. So we sort of talked about the benefits of, of clean energy. Um, if you know someone who's had problems with um, energy costs, or if you know how it's negatively, potentially negatively impacting the community, um, please uh, chime in on this part here. So challenge, uh, a nice powerful one here in the bottom corner, lack of financial, um, uh, options for low income to, uh, let's see, low income to incentivize equitable transition. This also uh, applies to people who, to people can afford uh, to make the transition. So uh, that's a definite observation uh, about a challenge. That's a great challenge. The, 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 you know, if we're going to transition to electrification and you've got a gas, um, and all the benefits in, in electricity, but you're still on a gas system, it's hard to make that challenge and make that investment in your, in your property if you're in the uh, disadvantaged income bracket. So um, understanding those sorts of challenges and understanding the scope of that is, um, is important. Being a renter is a nice um, observation on the on the challenges. Uh, you're not able to control your sort of systems in your house. The the, the owner of the house is often um, is almost always in charge of, of the systems in the house, <clears throat> and uh, so you've got fairly little influence other than your sort of market influence um, to. Uh, make any significant change there. There's uh, the, that concept is sort of a, what they call a split incentive. There's um, the, in, the incentive is, is for you to have a lower bill, but the um, uh, the owner of the property uh, ha doesn't have much incentive to make a change for energy efficiency. So um, that's definitely a, a, a challenge. There's another one up here. Owners of apartments might worry about um, <clears throat> getting profits instead of making a change. Other challenges, people often need assistance in weatherizing, uh, putting in a programmable thermostat, uh, et cetera. Uh, another challenge, homeowners forced to choose between uh, utilities and medication, as, as Aton was uh, uh, alluding to, the one of the highest um, reasons for a um, payday loan is to pay a utility bill because they're often a surprise. Uh, cold snap occurs and you don't know or you get a water leak. Fossil fuel prices are uh, high now, um, and so volatile gas and natural prices are going up dramatically. Um, it's definitely a um, volatile market. The sort of demand uh, going into the winter is, is caught creating some volatility as well as some um, uh, lower uh, supply. So always subject to a, a, a market. Um, and that's those will eventually find their way into electricity bills through our uh, the a uh, fuel component of your electricity bill. So that's something to do. So these are coming together nicely. If you've got some um, sort of final thoughts here, please go ahead and um, try to sneak one in, but we're gonna move on to the next, but these are great observations about the challenges. 
good observation here about the inertia and making upgrades and changes can take a degree of commitment. And we were discussing earlier how um, making a shift in your equipment is, is often ha oftentimes happens when um, uh, the equipment fails. And the last thing you want to do is do all the effort that's necessary to make a shift from gas to electricity uh, when it's um, freezing cold outside. And, and uh, uh, so you often stick with what you've got. And so that's getting prepared for that and getting set up for any of those changes and moving to um, other efficiency equipment is important. All right, we'll do, I'll read one more here and then we'll go to the, to the next, next slide or the next uh, board section. But a good, good one here is this uh, lack of knowledge about high efficiency items. I think that there is um, uh, heat, heat pumps in particular had a, got a bad name when they first came out. Uh, the technology was um, uh, did all right, but it uh, had a, troubles in really cold weather. But the new technology has definitely um, upgraded and the ability to switch over to a heat pump is, is pretty substantial. And there's lots of, uh, lots of technology upgrades that have occurred. So the um, good observation here about the, um, I made a comment a little bit earlier about the people trying to make decisions between um, choosing between food and utilities. Um, so we're sort of creating a little category over here, um, you know, choosing between food and related food insecurity. Um, you know, when you've got a surprise bill and, and, um, and you've got a grocery list to go up against that, it's, a, it's definitely a challenge. And definitely the, the, the we've got to remember that uh, probably in Decatur, I forget the, the exact numbers, but, um, you know, probably in the households in Decatur, you know, definitely over 40% are um, uh, rental households. Uh, and so uh, making sure that they, we've got um, substantial program elements in place for uh, helping renters um, uh, enjoy the benefits of the transition. All right, so please continue if you're finishing up one, but I think we'll go to the next. Um, next section. And it looks like people have been here already, so this is great. Thank you all for diving in. It's a great personal challenge here. Conflict between tree ordinance and installing solar. Um, that is uh, something we definitely uh, Definitely want to make clear that uh, rarely does it make sense to um, uh, take down a tree to uh, install solar, uh, especially at the house scale. Um, and so um, we're really going to try to hopefully make that clear as part of this uh, moving forward. Someone made an observation that uh, you bought a solar panels and the, the, the fee structure that uh, uh, Georgia Power sets up and the inability to sort of sell back to the grid uh, is um, takes it longer to pay off. We were talking about that with one of our um, policy uh, advocates here that you'll hear from shortly. All right, this is a great observation that uh, uh, so many of you are so tuned in. It sounds like a lot of you were taking advantage of the solar, Solarize program, Solarize Decatur Decab program, and understand about the <clears throat> benefits. Uh, so let's pull all those net metering benefits over. It seems like many of you who have um, engaged in the uh, Solarize program have sort of run into that uh, problem of, of the lack of net metering, which we can explain a little bit if, if some of you are 
unfamiliar, but um, ultimately the, uh, the, the ability of solar to pay for itself ends up uh, being problematic. So if we don't have net metering, we were discussing that with a stakeholder yesterday. Feel stuck using Georgia Power, which I could choose a community to use community solar. Community solar is where uh, there are solar panels that you effectively uh, sign up to, to buy power from. And there's lots of, of uh, sort of state level uh, legal problems with, with all of that. So that is a uh, that is a challenge and will continue to be a challenge. Um, but we're going to have to we're, we're going to try to address that as much as we can inside of our um, inside of our uh, clean energy plan. So I, there's a comment in the chat about uh, uh, feel good action around heat pumps and uh, versus your uh, gas furnace. And I think that the uh, one of the things that we need to, to contemplate is the, uh, the how efficient a one of those systems are. And, and we'll definitely have sort of commentary inside of a, a plan around that. So there's a good comment here, desire to keep historic original windows, which are single pane wood with sash, uh, sash weights. Um, windows, uh, single pane windows can feel very, um, like you're losing a lot of energy out of them. And, and uh, you definitely are. Um, one of the things that we, um, there are lots of good reasons to um, replace windows, but energy efficiency uh, and return on investment are rarely one of them. Uh, this is, comes from um, some of our uh, South Base's experience with um, uh, the where the energy goes in your house, and um, I would, uh, if you've got historic windows and they're in good shape and they're they're working, uh, storm windows are a great option for the uh, cold and hot seasons when you're not opening them too often. They're a great investment, and um, uh, in, in in the payback on the energy payback on window replacements is well over, um, usually well over 20 years. And so rarely does it make sense to, to do that for uh, energy efficiency. Excellent, okay, well, these are really doing well. Um, I think we're going to uh, move to our next segment. Continue, feel free to continue with this. Um, if I'm missing a, sex, a segment, um, remind me, uh, I think, do we add a fourth uh, section or is are we? see that's the that's the um end for this listening session well congratulations to you decatur these this was a, a, a to me a huge success thank you so much for your um well informed and uh well thought out um, um app applicability to those questions um so one of the things we're going to do now uh, we've got uh, a great wealth of people um, in the uh, clean energy industry indicator or in the sort of our immediate um, uh, nearby orbit, if you will. They may not necessarily live in Decatur, but uh, many of our um, uh, clean energy industry uh, participants uh, uh, live in Decatur uh, because of its great livability. And so we've tapped a few of them to uh, give a quick little uh, sort of shark tank pitch on potential policy solutions. Now that we've sort of heard the challenges and heard the, the potential, um, we're going to give a, a quick pitch, um, two minute pitch on uh, about, about six um, policy solutions 
that would allow the I'm going to get let to go to Sean Aurora first. I'm going to get him get him queued up, and make sure he's ready to go uh, as I finish this a uh, little bit of introduction. Uh, so we're going to go through six sort of potential policy solutions. Again, a quick Shark Tank type pitch. And then we're going to, after that's done, um, we're going to go into a couple of breakout groups and get your feedback on those potential policy solutions and do another Miro board to let you comment on how applicable they may or may not be um, uh, for Decatur and Decatur Clean Energy Plan. So um, let's lead off with um, Sean Aurora. Sean, Sean is a uh, former South Baser as well, lives in Decatur. Um, is now heading at, at Georgia Tech, heading up the living building project there, um, and, uh, and and is a huge advocate for, for advocate for solar. Worked on a, a lot of solar uh, uh, advocacy projects and uh, has a nice solar installation on his home. So, Sean, can you give us a little pitch about solar and its potential? Well, Georgia has a lot of solar potential. Um, you know, we've proven that. Uh, there's a lot of very um, knowledgeable folks on this call about solar. So, you know, jumping right into the success of the first Solarized Decatur program, a uh, community bulk purchase program, which allows members of the community to get advantage of bulk purchase pricing. We did, uh, we, we, we solarized our home through that project. It was about almost 800 kilowatts of solar that was installed. It was so successful, there was a second round. Um, but um, there's other things as well. Uh, right down the street, Emory University has over five megawatts of solar that's going to be installed on its campus on site. And its upfront cost for that solar is nothing because it was enabling legislation in 2015 that allows for third party ownership of solar on your property where you are buying those solar electrons from the owner of that solar system. But right down the street, we've got an example of a perfectly legal approach that could be utilized here in the city uh, on commercial government and uh, residential buildings. But uh, someone had already mentioned that there still are regulatory barriers. Please call your public service commission and say that you want retail net metering to come back for um, for residences, you know, my home went from not being retail net meter to retail net meter, and the the, the savings were unbelievable. Um, in March of last year, my electricity bill was one hundred thirty five dollars, and in March of this year, my electricity bill was fifty five dollars, all because of retail monthly retail net metering, which means I'm selling electrons back to Georgia Power for the same rate that I'm buying electrons from Georgia Power. And that happens uh, every month. Uh, so, so, you know, there's things that can be done. Call your public service. Robert, I think you're muted. Thank you all. It looks like Sean might've frozen up on us and uh, State level. about to, Wrap up anyway. Thanks, thank you, Sean. Sorry that uh, we cut off the very. He was talking about uh, advocating for uh, net metering. Um, we're going to um, make our transition to Amelia Godfrey uh, next. Uh, another South Facer, not necessarily a um, uh, a Decatur resident, but uh, is a wealth of knowledge on workforce training. Um, Amelia, are you uh, queued up and ready to go? I hope so. Yes. Thank you so, for joining uh, in. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Amelia Godfrey, and yes, I am not a Decatur resident, but I do a fair bit of work with the CD Decatur through your high performance uh, building ordinance. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with that, uh, Decatur does require uh, that new homes and new you know, commercial buildings and multifamily buildings in Decatur be built to a, a green building certification program. And that has really pushed a lot of the efficiency goals of the city in, in a really, really strong direction. Um, I was asked to talk about zero energy as like a next step for your uh, building requirements. And not just in terms of how zero energy is good for the building stock, but also how it benefits the workforce in the city of Decatur. Um, one of the biggest uh, lessons learned and also sort of 
challenges, admittedly, with the green building ordinance was training the everyone from architects to general contractors to all of the different subcontractors on how to meet high performance building standards. And to go to net zero would require another investment in that type of training. And thinking beyond just training people to, to meet these kinds of standards, this is a skill that carries on throughout someone's career. And so you're investing in your long-term community because people are able to take those skills apply them not just to buildings built in Decatur, but also to buildings, any project that they work on in the entire state of Georgia. And it creates just stronger buildings, stronger business practices across the entire network. Um, so you're able to take either people that are coming to the beginning of their career and teach them you know, everything from indoor air quality standards, how to do ventilation, how to do you know, really good insulation and air sealing, um, to comprehensive, like here's how you implement something like zero energy into a ground up construction project and how that is going to, again, carry on for years because that's a skill that isn't a one-time use type of, of concept. That's something that people are gonna use um, and be able to develop on as the city of Decatur progresses throughout um, its sort of goals, you know, thinking long-term, what are you gonna do the next five years, 10 years, 50 years, and so on. And I'll stop talking now. Maybe that was great. Um, thank you so much for sort of laying that out. We're gonna to go to Diane, uh, Diana Burke next, um, but uh, Amelia, thank you so much for taking the time. And we know that you've um, got a, a young one that you need to tend to. So thank you, if, we understand if you need to drop off. Thanks again. But so Diana, uh, Diana Burke is a, a former South Bay as well, but definitely a, a Decatur resident has gone on some great uh, work and is working on um, the, at the New Buildings Institute, uh, which provides a lot of information around how new buildings can uh, be a part of the clean energy solution. Diana, can you jump in with us? Sure. Um, so as Robert said, I'm Diana Burke. I work on the codes and policy team at NBI. We're a nonprofit that pushes for net zero energy and net zero carbon buildings. Um, and I just wanted to commend Decatur for taking a huge step towards reducing the city's carbon emissions in the built environment through the adoption of their high performance energy standard in 2015, um, which requires, as Amelia said, green building certification for all new buildings in most residential and commercial renovations. Um, but I, like Amelia, I strongly believe it's time for the city to to consider an update to the standard because more can be done. At NBI, we've worked with states and municipalities across the country to put them on the path towards a net zero energy code so that new, new buildings produce as much energy as they consume. We've also worked to develop electric vehicle and solar ready requirements for existing buildings. And sorry, <laughs> electric vehicles, vehicle and solar ready requirements for new buildings and, uh, and even code requirements for existing buildings, all of which working together can cost effectively and equitably reduce the city's carbon emissions. If these requirements were put in place in Decatur, for example, renters, which I know we discussed previously, whose landlords have no incentive to design buildings to reduce utility bills or include an EV charging outlet, will be able to, those renters will be able to save money on their utility bills and purchase electric vehicles if these are in the code. Um, additionally, Decatur could consider encouraging developers to utilize the state's low-income housing tax credit program. Low-income housing tax credits are given to developers of affordable housing throughout the state of Georgia. And in Georgia, uh, these tax credits heavily incentivize the construction of efficient, green, affordable housing units that are solar ready, uh, thanks to the work of uh, South Face for influencing the state qualified allocation plan. Um, I live in Winona Park and was thrilled the city was considered, considering the addition of some affordable housing units in nearby Legacy Park. And I would love for those units to be um, green, affordable, solar, resilient buildings. 
And that's really great. Thank you for the uh, plug on the work uh, that we've done with the Department of Community Affairs, where uh, not only is the international codes, the building codes reside, but the housing uh, tax credit program resides as well. So um, we're very proud of that relationship and, and, uh, and your, your work in that space as well. We'll go to Blythe Coleman uh, Mumford next. Um, but Diana, thank you so much for your time and, and appreciate your, your input. And please, if you can stick around and, and help us um, uh, with the next policy section. Uh, Blythe, are you ready to talk about uh, community engagement and the importance uh, therein? Absolutely. So I'm really happy to be here today to really engage in the space of authentic community engagement and creating that experience, the listening sessions. It's really something that Partnership for Southern Equity really advances in our work and our different portfolio teams. I'm coming from our Just Energy portfolio team, which works to reduce um, energy burden in the metropolitan Atlanta area, also in rural Georgia and the regional South for our coalition work our circle work, um, Green League Analytics is a circle member of ours. So really this is a very, um, we're already in a family here <laughs> really with all the partners we have on this call. Um, and really it's really important in this conversation, I think to name um, racial inequity. If we're not renaming race in these conversations, we're not tackling the full extent of energy inequities and um, working towards energy security for all. So it's really important for our team um, and our organization to name race in every aspect of discussing energy a burden, energy and security um, to advance policies the way we really need to to tackle the full extent of the issue. Um, so I'm really happy to be here today with Decatur. I know that Decatur does a really phenomenal job engaging community already. Um, and one thing I would like to plug on our end that I would love Decatur residents to look out for is Just Energy Academy which is seven month long leadership development program that really engages community residents from again, across the regional South on these issues of what is energy inequity? What is energy security? How can we advance policies from the grassroots up? Um, how can we also learn just basic terms like what is integrated resource planning? What is the rate case? How can you actually read your energy bill to understand like what it's reflecting, what it, what's actually being taken out? Where's your energy coming from? And really all those issues are really discussed in different modules that we map out over the seven month long program from February to um, around August. And so um, in the virtual space, we host about two month, um, two, sorry, two sessions a month that really dive deep into these issues. And I would love to be able to plug this in the chat if people are interested in applying. Um, it's really open again to anyone who um, has any kind of experience discussing energy inequities from really any um, community standpoint, you could be a neighborhood planning unit leader, you can be working for the Public Service Commission, and you want to learn more about how to actually engage with race and energy and intersections therein. It's really for anyone. So I would love to be able to plug this and give me one second to get this link again in the chat. Please do. And again, please share widely. And we always look for referrals from our partners like South Face and GreenLink Analytics. Um, GreenLink is actually a, um, uh, a partner that actually speaks in one of our modules about um, mapping energy inequities. And it's really important that community knows different tools to be able to actually use data to explain their real life lived experience. And that's why listening sessions like this are so important to actually use data to um, in tangent with what we're actually hearing communities speak of and are prioritizing um, that are issues for them in, in terms of like, are you a renter? Are you a homeowner? Does rooftop solar work for you? Does community solar work for you? Because we understand that if you don't own a home, rooftop solar might not be a priority. So how can we think about other ways to engage in solar? How can we also get more people in the solar industry knowing that the renewable energy industry needs more diverse participants and needs more um, diversity in general to actually have um, a base of folks from all experience levels who are, you know, in this work to grow that just economy in the way we need to. So all these issues are things we're thinking about in our academy curriculum and also in discussions and way we engage with um, federal and local policy. Um, so I'd love to just bring that up in this space and bring Decatur along because it's really important. Powerful work by, thank you so much for that, your work. Um, and you, we sort of mentioned a little bit about the solar sort of aspect of it, but the, 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 the sort of community activism that's necessary to, to really make some changes at the state level is, is, is really where there's some real powerful work happening there. So thank you for that. Um, and please stick around if you can and, and, and chime in on the, the after uh, the comment section uh, after this. Um, next, we'll go to Nathaniel uh, Horadam uh, and talk about sustainable mobility. 
Thanks, Robert. And I should probably quickly introduce myself. I'm filling in for Ruthie Norton. Uh, I work for Center for Transportation and the Environment for an Atlanta-based nonprofit uh, that does works nationally uh, and works um, in clean mobility. Uh, we, we support the development and commercialization of clean energy technologies, uh, primarily for medium and heavy duty vehicles. Uh, I personally am supporting MARTA's first uh, electric bus uh, deployment project funded through a federal grant. Uh, and then Ruthie, who asked me to step in here today, has been supporting Decatur um, in, in the feasibility of converting its entire municipal fleet of vehicles, all vehicles, to uh, completely zero emission, um, uh, all electric. And, and those initial results show that 100% um, of Decatur's sedans can be swapped out at this point. Um, they don't have a challenging duty cycle, so that's great. Um, there are also options for medium and heavy duty vehicles that are um, more coming online in the next few years. They're, they're reaching that, that key stage of commercialization, um, but federal funding sources are needed, which is a great thing to talk about um, with this infrastructure bill um, that President Biden signed on Monday and then possibly a lot more money coming down the pipeline through the Build Back Better Act or the Reconciliation Bill, um, which may come in the next month. But uh, the bottom line is there is a lot, a lot of federal money for all municipalities, counties, states, and the uh, municipalities in the Atlanta region, and even the state of Georgia to pursue uh, to help us along on our clean energy transition and to electrify all of our vehicles as quickly as possible which are going to be inherently more sustainable um, than their, their diesel, gasoline, or, or CNG alternatives, or propane in the case of school buses. Um, and, and then also what this infrastructure bill does, uh, a lot of is promote um, a shift away from, from auto mobility toward, um, toward your feet and wheels um, and toward more efficient modes of transportation, particularly transit. Um, uh, sidewalks, bike lanes, trails. Uh, while we've been on this call, the Atlanta Beltline just won a $17, $16 million grant from the U.S. Department of Transportation to finish out the Southside Trail. So that's really exciting. This administration is heavily pushing um, those projects. It does not want to give money to GDOT to build more highway lanes so or other state DOTs to do the same thing. Um, so, so that's a great opportunity both in terms of how we can quickly transition our fleets of existing vehicles and, and how to move toward um, more sustainable transportation modes. I, and we're talking billions here across all of these different programs. So um, start looking into it. Uh, it's a great opportunity for, for the region and for Decatur specifically. Thank you. Outstanding, Nathaniel. I appreciate that uh, uh, rundown and that uh, sort of opening around the, the opportunity there. And, and we'll take a look at that as it comes across. Uh, next, we'll go to um, Mike Barsick, uh, a South Facer and Decatur resident, and uh, to give us a quick moment on uh, energy efficiency and that potential policy solution. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'm Mike Barsick, and uh, it's kind of neat because I've been involved with solar with Sean. I have solar panels on my roof. Um, I've been involved in workforce training, Amelia, uh, taught lots of weatherization folks over the years. Uh, Diana Burke and I were heavily involved in Georgia's energy code uh, a decade ago when we were actually leaving the country briefly. And um, I've worked a little bit on community engagement through pro uh, uh, volunteer efforts and things like the Martin Luther King Project. And um, I sometimes ride a bike. So that, that's my connection with all of them. Uh, weatherization uh, has energy efficiency has of course been around for a while and many people know of it as from the low income weatherization program, which is a, a DOE, a Department of Energy funded effort. Um, and it, it is, I'm here because I think I'm the poster child for this. Uh, like me, energy efficiency is probably some of the least sexy and least blingy and exciting stuff and probably downright messiest things that we can do. However, as excited as I am about my solar panels, which are um, probably going to have a 12-year payback, um, the efficiency stuff that we talked about has a much faster bang for the buck, much, much higher payback. And um, it's just not sexy. I'll be the first to admit it. 
uh, but it has huge implications and it's a great piece of uh, equity to, to take homes that are not efficient and people are struggling with their bills to make those more efficient, but also not just low income, everybody income. Uh, there's, there's tremendous opportunities in just about any home in the South to make it better. I live in a hundred year old home. I did not want to put lipstick on a pig, so to speak, with solar panels on an inefficient energy hog. So um, since we bought our house about 20 years ago, we have done a lot to make it much more efficient. And we still do have the original single pane wood sash weight windows. And um, prior, prior to solar, I think our, I don't remember what our utility or electric bills were, maybe 80, 82 bucks a year, a month rather. Now they're 27, I think, after solar. And our, our, our um, I'd stack our utility bills up against just about any other 100 year old home. And much of this is done on the cheap because I am the cheapest person you know. So I really want to save energy to save money. And I'm doing things that are very affordable in terms of their payback. So it's very much not about technology so much. It's not about slapping a technology on it to solve a problem. It's about taking a holistic approach and looking at the house as a system and there's a lot of good things that we can do in just about any home. So love talking about this stuff. And uh, you can always uh, get a hold of me through Seth. Or, um, doing a lot of great work with many people on this uh, phone call. Thank you. Outstanding, Mike. Thank you so much for that. It uh, um, sort of points to there uh, as well as the, um, uh, the the importance of of, of sort of information being transmitted and so um and we really appreciate mike taking that and mike just completed a our first decatur 202 uh and so keep an eye out on the the clean energy decatur.com website's not there yet but it should be there shortly um and we're going to have that and several other topics that are going to uh, come through but we do want to keep things moving so we can stay on our uh, schedule so we're going to move now um back to um, the Miro boards, and we're going to divide into a couple of groups. And so remember, we're talking about solar, workforce training, building codes, community engagement, sustainable mobility, and energy efficiency. Um, we can do one, we can do all, uh, but we want your input on that. So we're going to move to that. So I think I turned it back to Lacey. Is that correct? Sorry for um, getting it over, but we are going to go back to a Miro board. And so yeah, if Maria can go ahead and um, put us into our two breakup groups. Yeah, so we're going to break into a couple of different groups so that we can um, uh, have in-depth conversations. Right. We're going to start here with section one to get your take on the policy and program options that were identified by our guest speakers a few moments ago. I guess a few of them are here, so you'll have very informed opinions to drop in. And please just go ahead and provide feedback concerns and suggestions with regard to these items. Are we going in order or just kind of jumping in wherever? wherever you want. Amazing.
I'll wait a minute or two before I start. Talking. Is there, of these six items here, is there one that y'all would like to start talking through first? Seem like the preferences might be towards solar codes or mobility. And let's start with mobility. So here so far we see separated bike lanes, expand path decator. Biking is often scary indicator. Painted bus lanes with camera enforcement and completely protected bike lanes and better walkability. I walk my kids to school and there are improvements that can be made. Transitioning to EVs is not as good as improving alternative forms of transport. Anyone want to expand on any of those items or have anything to add beyond those? I mean, I'll just say, even at CTE, you know, even though our mission is to transition the fleet over, um, you know, getting getting people walking and biking is always preferable. We're just taking transit altogether. That's always going to move the needle faster. I would love to know what areas people think would be better connected indicator because I also love biking through Decatur so I'd love to know what areas people are trying to get to I think Claremont was mentioned but like what does that connect to an institution an organization a building I'd love to hear more Uh, great question, Bob. Does anyone have any areas that they feel most nervous biking or driving or walking to and from that they feel most frustrated trying to get to or from? Uh, Blythe, I'll answer your question. I work remotely, so I don't go many places often. Um, but I, I put the comment in, I walk my kids to school and um, we have to cross South Columbia um to get to the friend school of atlanta and there are very few um crosswalks like crossing that street uh to get across that street uh in general like steve atlanta is just not a very walkable bikeable friendly city um and uh yeah so that's where i'm i'm troubled with and i've lived in a lot of few other cities i lived in norway for a year and um those communities tend to be, have better options and are just like, just healthier to live there. Whereas in Atlanta, it's just car, car heavy and I don't feel safe with my kids often. 
I think a lot of people go to Emory from Decatur and, you know, you know, people like these scooters or bikes, but it's not very easy to go from downtown Decatur to Emory. And I think that's a pretty heavily trafficked um, route from downtown Decatur to Emory. And it's just, we don't have a really good way that is not scary. And I do take Emory shuttle. I walk, um, but it's not a very fun walk, um, but I walk. <laughs> um, but, and I do take the shuttle, but I do think if, if there, if people were able to do scooters or something or bikes, it would be, you could get a lot of cars off the road. It's interesting to hear too, because I feel like there's a large culture indicator of biking. Like even when I like enter the city of Decatur, I feel like bikers are here, <laughs> but it's interesting to hear reflected that it could be better because there are places like that are more industrial, have like, you know, more um, businesses. And I think the South Columbia area that, you know, are not quite connected to, you know, the Stone Mountain Path or the area yet, there hasn't been that kind of extensive build out. So, I mean, I would love to do that because I've also personally biked through all those areas, try to see what area is safest for me to bike. And I've had some interesting experiences, but I can, I definitely hear this. All right, yeah. All right. So what about with regard to solar or building codes? Some of the key themes we see here are that we need community solar and how do we overcome barriers? We can take advantage of opportunities to market solar by putting it on schools, et cetera, and broadcast the cost savings. Begin with efficiency in solar for large buildings like churches, commercial properties, and the YMCA. Community solar options, trees over the house interfere with access. And advocate with the Public Service Commission to get back to a non-capped monthly netting program, ensure expenditures from infrastructure bill for institutional solar on city and school facilities, ordinance to require solar ready facilities. Any comments or additions? Um, I'll add that uh, it, working at NBI, we're working to introduce uh, solar requirements in the national code. Uh, and uh, the PNL and DOE are introducing amendments to the commercial code that would work require commercial buildings to have to produce 30% of their energy from solar. And that's because solar right now costs five to six cents a kilowatt hour. It's so cheap um, if you include it at the time of construction. And, and they're introducing an amendment to the national codes to require solar on residential buildings, about two kilowatts. So it's cost effective now to do that at the time of construction. We need to figure out what to do about all our existing buildings and buildings with shade where it doesn't make sense. Yeah, can someone speak to the tree ordinance? Because I don't really know much about that in the city of Decatur, but I'd love to hear that's an inhibitor to rooftop solar. Whoever put that comment. I'm not particularly familiar with the nuances of the Decatur tree ordinance. Is there anyone on here who could speak to that well? Sorry, bye. <laughs> Another time. <laughs> All right. Uh, and then the other item on here that we can lift up is building codes. And then we, in the interest of time, we should probably move on to the next section to make sure we have a chance to cover them. So highlighted here are how can we teach builders about energy efficient building techniques? Any affordable housing should be built to net zero, require new multifamily dwellings to have electrical infrastructure capacity to support electric vehicle charging, need to ensure all participants are involved, financial institutions required HERS rating, energy code compliance, we need to better staff and train to cater buildings department, induction stoves and no new gas hookups on new buildings, Adopt 2021 IECC plus amendments, including easy ready solar grid integration to get to net zero code by 2030. Those are some very specific and ambitious actions. So thank you. 
any comments or questions on these? Uh, this is Diana. I, uh, unfortunately, because of a recently passed bill by the Georgia State Legislature, HB 130, I think Hobie mentioned it in the chat, no city in the state of Georgia can incentivize or require uh, electric construction, um, which is a shame because if we're going to get to net zero carbon emissions, we have to stop using fossil fuels in our buildings. Um, so we need to work with our legislature to undo that bill if we want to require uh, all electric buildings. Diana, is that is that actually is that specifically what it is, or is it just a prohibition on prohibiting natural gas hookups? It's yeah. I mean, that's what we would like the code to do is prohibit natural gas hookups so that buildings are all electric. Um, and then there is also language in there that's very wishy-washy where the city could get sued if they um, incentivize people to, to use electric, uh, to, to move away from natural gas as well. We've got about five minutes left here. And the next session section I've highlighted here is feedback on how these policies or any others that might not be on here can also advance community well-being and equity. Okay, I'm seeing distribute the community costs and savings. Electric trucks, electric trucks and buses with fewer than 2.5 particulates and NOx emissions. Do you think buses? Oh, sorry, Megan. I was gonna say, do you oh, think buses area are in like the correct places indicator? I'm wondering if people have any thoughts on where bus lanes or um, areas could be maybe more equitable or if they're in correct places now based on people's experience. Any other comments or feedback on this one? We've got about one or two minutes left. So if we can also migrate to the final item or skip it. Oh, people populated the final item. <laughs> Maybe we make sure we go through this. So section three was hindrances to equity. So how might these potential policies interfere with achieving community well-being and equity? So one item was more walking equals healthier community less pollution equals less asthma. Make sure we incentivize existing buildings to become more energy efficient without creating a financial burden on households who can't afford those improvements. And for the more walking equals healthier communities, was that tying into like, we need to build out better sidewalk infrastructure or walking infrastructure indicator to promote that? And we're seeing if high income homes have solar, will the cost be not passed on to lower income homes? 
that's a really important question and something that needs to the city needs to be cognizant of as a design program. Prioritizing electric cars over removing cars is still going to leave plenty of emissions, increase road fatalities, and make pedestrian slash cycling activity harder. Georgia Power could raise rates with loss of revenue from solar. Electrification is done incorrectly can increase utility bills, an important flag. And how will lower income residents afford electric cars? Also a very important consideration. Okay. Any last comments on this? We'll go ahead back to the main breakout group in a moment. Then I think Maria, are you the breakout group in C that can take us all back? Yeah, I started the countdown basically. Um, so now I just get to watch people leave. Cool. I'll see everyone back in the main room. So thank you for the uh, opportunity to, to, to have some community listening and some great input uh, you all. Um, so the, uh, We've got some few, few more people connecting in here. So I want to, we're in the process of wrapping up now. Um, thank you so much for all your input and your uh, skill with the Miro board and um, some great ideas and some great thoughts. And, and, you know, oftentimes we have to really keep in mind the, um, the challenges we have. And I, I think um, I was noting in the other, um, the first uh, breakout group that, the, the the positiveness of the uh, of this uh, of the clean energy transition is uh, the, the the sort of strength that you all are bringing to this is very inspiring, and um, I want to sort of congratulate you on that. Um, and uh, you you were you were much more about the the positive aspects, uh, but I think we did capture some some challenges, and so I'm excited that. Um, we know there's challenges and that you're aware of them and how we work through them, uh, but the, the sort of positive energy that was all that, I really want to thank you all for that, and you should all give yourselves a, a nice round of applause for that. Any other and, uh, Robert, closing business? Good, uh, David, go ahead. Yeah, I also want to take a sec um, and just invite people, if you have additional thoughts uh, after this meeting um, and throughout the, the planning process, if you want to send um, additional comments and ideas to that clean energy indicator at gmail uh, address will um, or we would be uh, thrilled to take those yeah so we've got this a great segue um, the uh, the uh, QR code here will take you to the website um, as David noted the clean energy indicator at gmail.com um, email address is at the bottom right um, another click on the, um, you can't click through the, the, the presentation here, but that's the clean energy decatur.com, um, you know, and, um, and there's a survey there as well as, as that. Uh, so any, uh, I think we, just to sort of a recap as well, um, before we sort of wrap for the evening, um, we got two more of these round tables. Um, so the, the, the next topic um, is, uh, someone's gonna have to help me now actually, but I know the third topic is the built environment. Um, and actually, the second topic is the um, clean uh, economy, uh, clean energy economy. I may be misnaming that directly. 
Uh, and so we are going to uh, have two more of these. And ultimately, all of this input goes into a charrette that we're going to be holding sometime in mid-March. Uh, and so there will be more about that coming here in the uh, rest of the end of the year and the beginning of next year. Um, and you're going to see, hopefully in person, uh, hopefully the, the, the COVID wane continues to wane and we'll be able to entertain people um, uh, appropriately masked uh, somewhere in Decatur where we uh, all come together and, and do boards like this together. And, and we can hope for sure, hopefully. Um, any else on the team? Am I missing anything before we uh, close out? Uh, again, I would also uh, invite folks that um, are here tonight to help share this information. Um, it's going to take all of us as we transition. And so as many folks as we can engage now will know that we're making a plan um, for and by Decatur. So again, please share the link um, to the survey, to the website, uh, et cetera, and maybe bring somebody with you uh, for our next round table. Excellent. Good point, David. And and uh, we like to say that uh, you know when you're making a plan that has a, a 15 to uh, you know 40 year timeline, you're going to need as much sort of buy in from everyone as possible. So uh, thank you all for your your input and and um, help create that engagement. David was mentioning uh, to help so that the plan can carry through over time. All right, I think we're done. Thank you all again, and, uh, and definitely give yourselves uh, some high fives on the way out, and, and we really appreciate your attendance, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Good night.